Welcome to the podcast, Let the Prophet Speak. Today we are studying Amos, the mm-hmm. book of the prophet Amos, or Amos, chapter 4. And this is Saul Weiner, the host of your podcast. We previously studied Amos, chapter 3, and we read of the special relationship between God and his people. Um, the relationship where there's a give and a take, that the people have been chosen for a specific responsibility, and therefore that relationship has its ups and its downs. Um, and we discussed uh, uh, looking at the world ar- around us, looking at the signs around us and interpreting them and remembering that God is behind nature and remembering that we should interpret these signs in order to learn the appropriate lessons. Today, we some continue on that theme but Amos is going to emphasize here the idea of, of, of God's relationship of, with the people being, I mean, uh, I guess tit for tat, so to speak. That the way the people behave is the way the people will be treated. And we begin with what seems to be a critique of the women of, of, uh, of Israel, of the northern kingdom. Um, Now, why I say what seems to be is because I'm going to read this first the way it is read by most of the commentaries and indeed the way I originally read it. But then, after some thought, um, I think I have another approach which I'm going to read as well. And I guess you can decide for yourselves which one you like better. So I'm going to start reading this way. Shimu hadavar hazeh. Listen to this thing. Paros habashan. You cows. The cows of, of, of Bashan. Bashan is a place which is lush with green pasture. Asher Bahar Shomron, those of you who live on the mountain of Shomron. Paros is, a, is a written in a feminine form. And uh, it is assumed that this is a critique of, of women of living in the lap of luxury. Women who, who, um, who, uh, who uh, are, are as follows. We're about to read. Ho'oshko Stalim, he continues. Those of you who... who Oppress and take things away from those that are poor. Harotitsos evionim, those who crush the destitute. You know, people that live a lifestyle ignoring the, the unfortunate lifestyle of the much less pe- fortunate people around them. Haomros ladonihem, those that say to their husbands, Havia vanishte, come give me more to drink. And anishte here would then mean, let's drink some wine, let's party, you know, let's live a frivolous lifestyle, careless, carefree, and not thinking about the consequences of their lifestyle on the people around them, on the have-nots. Nishba Adonai B'kacho, God will swear in His, in, with his, in his holy place, or actually B'kacho, in His holiness, Ki yomim bo aleichem, that our day is coming upon you. V'nisa eschem b'tinos, and He will carry you in tinos, often baskets. V'achrischen b'siros duka. And your end will be in, in fish traps, in, in, in nets captured by the enemy. Uh, duga, Tziros Duga would be fish traps as a metaphor. Or it could also mean Vi'acharishchen, and the last one of you in a fish trap will be caught, carried away in, in traps. Rather than, and your end will be. It depends how you want to translate that. And each woman will go, be taken out through the broken walls, each one together with her friend. And each one will be thrown on the harmona, which, um, um, which is translated as on the, refuse, on the heap of refuse. So says God. Now, if this is actually a critique of the women, I would like to compare it to Isaiah 3. Um, for those of you that studied Isaiah with us, you may remember Isaiah 3, um, where he went ahead and um, in verse 16 began a crit- criticism, a crit- direct critique of the women, where he says, Vayomer Adonai Ya'an ki gavu benos tzion, because the women of Zion have become arrogant and they goron and they're lifting up their necks in the in the sky, thought with their with their chin in the air, 
and uh, roving or winking eyes. And he went on a critique of the women and their and their and their arrogant and um, lifestyle. However, another way of understanding this is that, and remember, and, and the, remember, he started in the first verse by saying "paros abashon," you cows of Bashan. In, in English, in modern English, the word cows, can, it sounds like an extremely derogatory way of referring to a woman. But that's a modern thing. Paros Habashon, I don't necessarily believe, is referring to women specifically. I think he's actually, and based on the context of who he was talking to in the previous three chapters and the remainder of this chapter, I think he's just comparing the people of Israel to Paros Habashon, to cows that are fat living in lush green pasture that always have what to eat, that are taken care of so well. And they grow so fat on their, on their oshek of dalim, on, the, on their oppression of the poor. And they become so arrogant that they are omros la donehem. They say to their masters, give me drink, give it to me, come bring it here. They're too lazy to go themselves and get water. They demand as if they're entitled to it. And, then when, and, and the fact that this is written in a, in a feminine form in the verbs is very often the prophet uses a feminine noun to refer to the people of Israel or feminine verbs and and it doesn't always refer to women specifically I don't really believe that almost is talking to women directly here I think he's talking to the entire people um, and the fact that it says there are many times when when the which means that the women will go with their friends uh, they'll be kicked out through the the broken walls, the breached walls. That's that again. That appears many times in the prophets, and when they describe the coming destruction and punishment, they describe the women being taken out as either as captives or killed, or 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 pillaged or raped or whatever. But those descriptions are often said because right now God then directs His words not to the women but to all the entire people in verse four, and He continues and says, "Bo'u Beit Elu Pishu." Go ahead to Betel. Go to that place. Betel is where the temple of the uh, calf that the northern kingdom had set up to worship instead of going to God's temple in Jerusalem. Go there, Upishu. Perform all of your negligence and all of your transgressions there. Ha Gilgal ha Shoah. Go to Gilgal, another place where they had idols. Go there and do as much as you want of sins. And in the morning, go ahead and bring... In other words, go there one day and do sins, the sins that you want to do there. The next day, go ahead in the morning and bring them all of the, the sacrifices that you bring there. And on the third day, bring all of your tithes, all of, your, all of the money you set aside to worship all of these idols. Go ahead and do it. Now, this is a, a, an unusual but not unprecedented incidence of sarcasm on the, on, in the part of the prophet. Because we did have it before, if you will, um, uh, in Joel, just preceding this, in chapter 4, in Joel, verse 9, where God says, Call out, Kiruzod Bagoyim, go ahead, call out to the nations, Kadshu Mechama, get ready for war, Ha'iru Hagiborim, get up all of your mighty men, Yigshu Yalu, Mechama, get all of your, your armies together. And, and put kitui techem lecharavos and grind, make your plowshares into swords, get ready for a big fight, right? The nikbitsu shama and gather there, hanchat adonai giborecha, where God is going to bring down the warriors. So again, uh, God, and, and it continues to the valley, God is, is taunting the people, saying, Go ahead, get all of your warriors together, come, go, come fight me in this valley of judgment. Because you're going to be nothing before me. Here, God is, well, God. I mean, through His prophet, obviously, Amos, Amos is is using that a similar kind of sarcasm. Go ahead, go do all your sins over there. Let's see how that works out for you. Vikater mechametz toda, and go ahead and bring your thanks offerings out of leaven, out of chametz leavened bread. Now, as we know, in the temple in Jerusalem, chametz leaven was generally prohibited to be brought as a as a carbon, as a sacrifice. And leaven was prohibited. And of course, one can imagine what the reason might be, but leaven is generally a symbol of wealth, a symbol of, um, of, of bounty, a symbol. And, and, and it's not, um, and in many cases, also a symbol of arrogance. 
So chametz is something we only brought on very rare occasions, uh, on, on the holiday of Shavuot. But in general, chametz was, uh, leaven was not something that was brought. So God is saying, go ahead, bring your leavened stuff to that, to that, to that idol that you're worshipping over there. V'kiru nidavot hashmiu. And go ahead and, and call out all of the nidavot. This reminds when people uh, call out, I'm going to donate uh, $10,000, I'm going to donate $15,000. Go ahead, call out all of your donations. Make them be known. Let the whole world know how generous you are to all of, that, all of the idols, all of the corruption, all of the stuff that goes on in those corrupt places. <laughs> because isn't that what you love? Isn't that what you love, the sons of Israel? No, Madam Elim, so says God. Again, there's this element of sarcasm here that one has to, has to recognize and understand from these verses. Vigamani, then God says, but you should know, if this is the way you're going to behave, you're going to go and bring all of your wealth, all of your, your chametz, your leaven, all of your, your sacrifices, all of your tithes, your masrot, all of your tithes, all of your donations, all of your money, you're going to bring it to sin, you're going to bring it for that, well then, I am going to do. And now here, this is written in past tense. God says, and I'm going to translate it, and then try to describe why he uses past tense. And I will also give to you clean teeth in all of your cities. Clean teeth is a reference to nothing to eat. You'll have nothing, no food stuck between your teeth to clean out. They'll be clean. And you will not have bread in all of your places. Or actually, and I have already made you suffer this fate. And you still did not return to me. So says God. Now, this and the next few verses that I'm about to read are written in past tense as if this already happened. And there's two ways to understand this. One is, and I, I've seen some commentaries in English call this the prophetic present. Because almost as a prophet is really saying this is what is going to happen. But because for a prophet what is going to happen is so clear and so obvious and, so, and, and looks to him as if it's happening now. So he's saying, I have done it. Because it's something that's like as if it's happened. Because it's happening in front of me. I see it happening. Based on the way you're behaving, this is the result. It's as if it happened already. That's one way of understanding it and probably the simpler way to understand it. But it could be that he's referring to previous times of suffering. And I kind of think that this is a little bit of a deeper understanding of these words. It is possible, and we'll, as we go through the next few verses, I'm going to try to show you some hints that Amos is actually referring back to a time of starvation, a time of hunger, a time when they went through suffering. And God, therefore, is saying that I gave you, the people, several different chances and several different ways to return to me. I gave you everything. You were once the Paro Tabashan. You were the cows in the green pastures where you had everything. You had all the food and all of the animals and everything you needed to live a, 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 a life full of satisfaction, a life full of everything you needed. And what did you do? You dumped it in the wrong direction. You became arrogant and you used it for the wrong reasons. And then I also put you through suffering. And this could be referring to the suffering that we read about in the previous book in Joel. The terrible suffering and starvation that occurred during the locust, the plague of locusts, which was accompanied by many other plagues as we read about in Joel. I can't specifically prove or say that it is referring to the same one, that same event of Joel, it's possible, but since we don't know exactly when Joel occurred historically, I can't tell you whether it happened before Amos, before Amos, or after. But something like that were events that did happen in the Northern Kingdom. And God is saying, You still did not turn back to me. I gave you everything and you rebelled. Then I punished you and you still didn't turn back. And I also, and this is verse 7, still in past tense, and I also held back from you at HaGeshem, the rain, three months away from harvest time, which apparently is a time when one needs the rain the most. Right then, I held it back away from you. And I made it in such a way that I rained upon one city, and the next city I did not let it rain. 
on one place, on one patch of land within the same field, I made it rain. On another patch of land in the same field, I made it not, not, not rain, I made it dry. The commentaries, most of them explain that from, but by doing it in this patchy way, here rain, there no rain, here the rain, there no rain, God is making it obvious that he's the one that's messing around. It's not some environmental thing that this year is a dry year. Because if it was a dry year, why did it rain there? But rather God's doing it for a reason. That's one way of understanding this. Another way of understanding this we can see from the next verse, and I'll read it and then I'll go back. And two or three cities will come to the one city that had rain, to drink, and then they will not be satisfied. God wanted to bring them together where some people have and some people don't have in order to demonstrate that you could try to cooperate. But rat or see, it can also cause fighting. When some have and some don't have, it can lead to one of two paths. It can lead to a path of cooperation, of help, and it can lead to a path of fighting and infighting, which unfortunately is where it led. And God said, And you still did not return to me, you didn't band together, work together, and figure out a way to make it work. But rat, and that's the purpose of the previous pasuk now, verse 7, where, where God said, I reign on one city and not this city, on this field and not that field. Because God wanted to create a situation and tell us, you see, there are situations where some have and some don't have, in order to help people learn and understand that this is the reason for the problem. The reason is oshek, the reason is oppression. When one group oppresses the others, I'm giving an opportunity to learn that lesson, but they did not learn that lesson, and therefore, verse 9, I went ahead and I struck all of you, I struck you with, with diseases of the, these are diseases of the crops. That, 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 in, 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 on many occasions, or in, in, a, in a huge way, they attacked your gardens, v'charmechem, and your vineyards, v'tenechem, and your figs, v'zesechem, and your olives. And all of those, on many occasions, these diseases attacked them. And yochal hagazom. And on many occasions, they were eaten by locusts. V'lo shavtem odaynu madonai. And those were attacks on everything. So I tried to give you an opportunity to learn and see each other and help each other, but no, you didn't return to me. And then I just attacked it all. And you still did not return to me. The gazam may be a reference to the gazam, to the locusts that we saw in the previous book, Joel, or may not, but I'm just making that suggestion as a strong possibility. But even if it's not, the idea remains the same, and that is that I gave you bounty and you rebelled. I punished you and you still didn't come back to me. I gave you an opportunity to learn how to cooperate with each other and you didn't come back to me. So then I destroyed it all, and you still didn't come back to me. Shilach tibochem dever, God says in verse 10, I sent you uh, pestilence, devers, disease of cattle, b'derech Mitzrayim, just like I did in Egypt. V'horag tibacherev bachurechem. I killed by the sword your, your bachurechem, literally means your, your, your young men. This is again reminiscent of what happened to the young men of Egypt in the 10th plague. Im shevi susechem. I, I, and, and they were killed along with the capture of your horses, so I took away your strength, your military might. And I made the stench, the ba'osh, the ba'osh is a, the stench, the horrific smell of rotting flesh. I made that rise from your camps, and in your noses, so you smelled the stench of death after these wars. In other words, I, after the punishment, of the rain and after the punishment of the diseases and after the punishments of the locusts and after the punishments of the dever of the pestilence and the punishment then I had soldiers come and attack you other nations come and attack you so maybe you would learn your lesson then and turn to me but you still did not turn to me and I turned you over and made a massive destruction like God turns over Sodom, Sodom, Amora and Gomorrah and Vatiyu, Kuhud, Mutsom, Tisreifa and you became like a uh, like a fire, like a coal that was a burning coal that was uh, that gets rescued from a large fire. You, there was like almost nothing left of you. and you still did not return to me. So these are obviously horrible, horrible things to hear. 
But what God is saying is, is that I tried every method. And remember, he started off with the good method. He started off with bounty. He started off with everything. And he tried so many different ways to get the people to return, but the end of each verse is the same. Lo shavtem adai. You still did not return to me. No Adonai, says God. You still didn't learn your lesson. You still didn't come back to me. Lachain, therefore, verse 12, ko, so, and ko means similar. Just like you do, I will do. Ko, in the same way as Selacha Yisrael, I will do to you, Israel. If that's the way you behave towards me, then this is the way I will behave towards you. Now, this is not all bad. This is also could be good. Akev, Akev means on the heels of, right? Akev is something that happens as a result of something else. Akev kizos eselach. Because this is the way I am going to work with you. This is the way I'm going to do with you and treat you. The same way that you treat me. This way. And therefore, I advise you, says God, he kon lekras alavach Yisrael. Prepare yourselves to greet your maker Israel. This is, um, to greet your God. Uh, this is the, if people often use this phrase, prepare to meet your maker, which is really, this is where that verse comes from. Prepare yourselves to meet God. In other words, get the message finally. I've done everything and you didn't get the message. I'm telling you, you see, I will act to you the way you act to me. If you come back to me, then there is still hope. You still can do it. Because behold, God is the one who created the mountains. And he was the one who created the wind. Um, God is the one who has told human beings what it is that he wants. God gave us the message. He told us through the prophets what he wants. He told us what the path is. The path of justice and righteousness. And Lech Amos has said so many times, and Yoel has said, and Hosea has said, and Yeshayo has said, and every prophet has said over and over and over again that God had told us what He wants. He's the creator of the world, and He did something very special to human beings. He told them what He wants. This is incredibly powerful. Do what He wants, and then He will treat you that way. Shachar Eifa. I'm sorry. O say shachar eifa. God is the one who can make morning and darkness. There's various ways to read this phrase. The best way to translate it is probably O say shachar eifa. He makes darkness into morning. Something that looks terrible, he can make it look good. What looks horrible sometimes looks like the worst possible thing can suddenly be something bright and beautiful. God steps upon the high places of the world. Bamaseyaretz usually refers to the high places on which idol worship and sin and, and immorality occurs. God stomps on all of that. All that is nothing before Him. God is the God of hosts. He's the God of everything. Not just the God of human beings, not just the God of this world, but the God of the tzivaos, of the stars, the sun, the moon, the entire universe. That is his name. He has the power to do everything. So therefore, since he told us, Masecho, he told us what he wants. Let's listen. Let's do what he asked. And then he coned. That is how we can prepare ourselves to greet our God. Thank you so much for listening to Amos chapter 4. Looking forward to studying chapter 5 and the rest of this beautiful book together.